number 98. Come, thou fount of every blessing, and we will have a key change before the third verse. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Good evening, folks, and I'm um, glad to have you with us tonight on Sunday. And uh, we pray that uh, as we come together that God will use this time to help us learn more about his word. And that God will help us as we move forward to be able to honor and glorify His name and help us to be prepared for the spiritual battles that we fight. Tonight, uh, we continue on with our three battlefields, and tonight we're going to be dealing with the church and um, casting the accuser of the brethren down. And so that's what we want to talk about. You know, the Bible tells us in John 8 44 that Satan is a liar. And as a matter of fact, he says he's the liar. Uh, uh, the father of lies and so we know that what we deal with and then if you went over to Ephesians chapter 6 it would tell you that we deal with spiritual enemies in high places that we deal with all kind of wickedness that we have to come against so tonight as we get started we're going to go to Revelation chapter 12 if you have your Bibles turn over to there we're going to go to 12 and we're going to look at verses 10 and 11 and we're going to look at two activities that that Satan has done. Now, I've got a lot of information here, and I'm going to try to condense some of it and make it a little shorter and be able to, to go from there. But uh, tonight, as we get ready to go into God's Word, let's just ask for His blessings tonight to be with us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that, God, you would anoint your Word. I pray tonight that, God, it will not be about this preacher, but that, God, it will be about you. I pray that you'll speak through your Word, that you'll teach us. And that, God, the power of the Holy Spirit will reveal truth to us. And, Lord, I pray that we'll leave this place saying it's been good to have been in the house of God. So, Lord, bless us tonight. Bless your word. And, Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, uh, verses 10 and 11, and it says this, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. 
and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren, and all of you need to listen to this closely. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and that they loved not their lives unto death. And so tonight, uh, uh, there will be a time when salvation, power, and the kingdom of God will, as the authority of Christ, be manifested on this earth. And while we wait for that event to unfold, if we choose to accept Him, the Spirit of the reality of, of Christ that comes into our life will, will be possessed by everyone that we talk with tonight, all of us gathered into the house of God, that the presence and the power of God will be in our life. Think about a place that it will be free of fault-finding, criticism, slandering, gossiping, with uh, sight set on purity, love, and prayer for each other. That time is quickly coming when God will allow us to be in His presence and be in a place where it will be like that. But as long as we live, we're reminded that the devil will try to sow his attacks and, and, and his traps for all of his children. That he will continually, as the scripture says there, that he will uh, be the accuser of the brethren. That he works in the spiritual realm and that he will attack us. We're reminded that, that Satan attacks the church for two basic reasons. And that is to deceive, for he's a liar. And the other is to accuse the brethren. And to make them before God. Do y'all realize today that what Satan does is that basically he brings accusations before God. Look at who you have here. They deserve hell. They deserve eternal punishment. Why would you save this person? Or look at him. He's no good. Look what he just did. Or what he thought or how he acted. And folks, I thank God today for the power of the blood that covers a multitude of sin that removes everything from this life that would hinder us, and by the power of the blood, we overcome Him. Amen. The Word of God says there, they overcame Him. That's talking about us too. By the blood of the Lamb, in the name of Jesus, in the power of His blood, they overcame Him. And by the word of their testimony. What is your testimony tonight? Can you testify that you belong to the Lord can you testify tonight that he lives in your heart? Can you testify tonight that Jesus died for your sins, that his blood was shed for you, and that he has set you free from a world of sin? That's how they overcame him, by the blood, by their testimony. And then these people in Revelation said that they were willing to live their life to the point that they were willing to give their life for what they believed in. And that may well be ours tonight. So in the church... When correction is required, the Bible tells us that, uh, well, let's just go over there. Go over to Galatians 6.1. Galatians 6.1. And we'll just look at that right quick. Now, I have a lot of scripture tonight, and we're going to try to move very quickly through this. But we'll look at Galatians 6.1. Now, I got a little turn happy. It says, brethren... If a man be overtaken in a fault. Any of you ever overtaken in a fault? Any of you ever mess up? But if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So the Bible tells us that those of us that are spiritual, if we see a brother that's struggling, if we see a brother that has failed on his face, those that are spiritual are to help them back to their feet, to nourish them, and to be able, and I'm not necessarily talking about food either, I'm talking about spiritually pray for them and get their feet back in the path. So we've got to learn to do that. Now, accusations against an elder. When you think about somebody coming against one of the elder senior citizens in our church here, the Bible says clearly that you're not to entertain those things. And if you do, it's got to be in front of witnesses. Go over to 1 Timothy. 519. And the reason I'm laying this out here for us tonight is, is, uh, is I want us to understand this is where the enemy attacks the church. And that's what the focal point is tonight. 519. It says, 
Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So it's talking about that's how important it is and how serious it is because this is where Satan works within the body of Christ. In any one of our churches that may, where you may be listening right now, Satan will try to sow his web of deceit and try to get people to gossip, to rumor, to backbite, to criticize, uh, to, to be hard on one another. You've heard the old saying many times, and we've said it here many times, that the Christian army is the only army in the world that kills its wounded. We will eat somebody alive, we will criticize them, gossip and rumor among, monger about them until we destroy them. And folks, the Bible tells us certainly that is not God's way because that's the way of the enemy. And again, it comes from the father of lies. It comes from that spiritual enemy. That, uh, that Ephesians talks about that is in the, the heavenly realm that is working. Now when a problem in the church is not addressed spiritually, the door opens up to, fi- fact, to fault finding, fleshly criticisms, and being judgmental over one another, which are evidences that the accuser of the brethren is assaulting the church. So the bottom line is this. If we come in here next week or if we're in here this Sunday, and we hear people that are making accusations about a number member of the church or talking about somebody that maybe don't look quite as good as they do or didn't come from the same area that they did or don't look like them or have done something that uh, has, has violated something, then sometimes we as Christians sometimes are quick to tear them apart. And folks, it's nothing more than Satan attacking the body of believers. So we've got to understand that. The accuser of the brethren. Now what is the result when this takes place in our body? Well, first of all, it restricts the Holy Spirit from working. All of you know this. If I were to tell Leonard, if he's looking at me, he said, Pastor, when, when is it in your life when you feel the most inept or weak? I'll tell you when it is. When I've been taken in sin or I've not been doing what I'm supposed to do and I have restricted the power of the Holy Spirit working in my life. And so that's what all this mess is designed to do in the church house. That's why many churches don't see people walk in the aisle to get saved. That's why you don't see people get sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And yes, I said those things. Folks, the Bible tells us that we are to to pursue after righteousness. We are to pursue for God to set us apart and to fill us with His presence. And yes, it comes in when we get saved, but the Word of God also says that we're to be filled with the Holy Ghost, that we can go forward and do work for the kingdom. So the Holy Spirit is restricted. Salvations become fewer and fewer. Power is minimized. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. When somebody is believing in God for a miracle, and they come up here to be anointed and prayed for, and we're living in the the attacks of the enemy and allowing the flesh to rise up, then God is not going to move amongst our prayers. Then God's not going to answer those things. And our spiritual authority has been crippled. And the church is in trouble. Amen? Amen. So that's why we have to allow God to help the church rise above these things. And that's why it's important for us to know that it's by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony that we overcome Him. Now, we know that we have access to God. If you think about John 14, 6, uh, verse 6, it says, uh, And Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we know that the Word of God says that the only way that we can have access to God, the only way that we can get to Him, is to go through Jesus. we got to go through the blood. We've got to go through Him. And all of us have to, in all of our lives, we had to come to a point where we chose to change our life by submitting our life to Christ and accepting God's free gift of salvation that came through Jesus dying on the cross and shedding His blood for our sin. If you would, take your Bibles and go over to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. And we'll just kind of uh, reiterate that. And i got a few more verses, but... We'll probably move on from those, but 145, verse 18. 145, verse 18. 
And it says, the Lord is nigh unto all that call upon him. To all that call upon him in truth. So folks, that means that he draws nigh to you when you call upon him in truth. Then I think about Romans 8.34. If you got your Bibles, flip over to there. We're just going to have a little sword drill a little bit today. Romans chapter 8. And I use this passage of scripture many times at funeral messages there at a graveside. Look at verse 34. Starts in 33, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? In other words, Leonard, what can I say about you? He belongs to God. God is his heavenly Father. And he's saying here, Paul is saying, Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. So folks, I want you to be reminded tonight that you don't belong to this world and that Satan is using his power and ability to lay traps and snares to keep the church from being what God would have us to be. That's why our churches are not full today. That's why people right now have been lured to sleep and and we've heard several lately, haven't we, Mark, that have told us uh, we've gotten used to staying out of the house of God now. We've got used to being at home. We've got used to sitting in a recliner and having a cold drink and maybe listening to a message or whatever. But folks, God is saying you better wake up. It is high time to awake out of sleep for our redemption draweth nigh. It's coming quickly and we've got to be ready. Then you go over to, if you would, go to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Let's go right over there and See what that says. Chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 25. Verse 25 says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That means there had to be a time in our life when all of us today had to recognize that, Lord, with all the filth and with all the failures and all the wickedness in my life, Lord, I bring it to the foot of the cross. Lord, I lay it down and I ask you for mercy today. I ask you for forgiveness. And that scripture right there says that despite what you brought, that God takes it and washes it away by the power of his blood and his sacrifice. So that's what all this is about. Who is the, the living church of God? It's all those born-again believers who have trusted Christ, who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. That's who Satan now is after. Oh, he's got many people deceived. They're lost. They don't want him. They've turned their back on him. They hate one another. They hate you. They hate me. They hate what we're doing. Because they don't know God. All of us know God. We know that He's a God of light. That He's a God of love. We know that He loves us. And so we know that what He's doing now is working inside the church to attack believers, to get us to to feel like we're less than what we're supposed to be, to get us to forget that we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation that has been born again, that has a home waiting on us in heaven. He wants us instead to turn on one another and to be hard on one another. So that's what we've got to deal with tonight is to be able to look at that. Now, when you think about God has called us not to judge one another, but to pray for one another. Every one of us in here. And we are to intercede when we see a need, not criticize. And that's not always easy to do. But you can't criticize people. You've got to pray for them. And you got to ask God to help them. We're not to follow the accuser and finding fault. We're to follow Christ's pattern of building and restoring. God's all about, you know, and I know y'all get, I hope you don't get tired of hearing it because it's the word of God. But in Lamentations chapter 2 it says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They're renewed every morning. 
Great is thy faithfulness. Aren't you glad today that God sees you today and he doesn't see you for the filth that you've done or the wrong that you've done, but he sees you through his son and he sees you with love and compassion and it never stops. And I thank God for that. I praise him tonight for that. So if he sees us that way, how should we see others? And folks, that means sometimes you've got to let some stuff go off your back. And I'm talking to myself too now. Sometimes it's not easy, but you've got to let stuff go by you. Sometimes people will say things that are hurtful. Sometimes things, people will do things that you don't like. And sometimes it will raise up the hair on the back of your neck. But we've got to have the power of God to put down because it comes from the enemy. And he attacks all of us. We're to see sin, and our response is to be an example of virtue. Is to be godly. And to be Christ-like. If we see weakness in the body, our call is to simply help strengthen. By the power of prayer and by love. When we discover fear, we must impart courage. And not be afraid. We have many people right now that are fearful about even coming out and going to church. Folks, in my opinion... There is no greater place that you could be than the house of God during these times. That we need one another and we need to move forward in Jesus' name. And when worldliness appears, we must display holiness. What is holy? Our God is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. There is no sin in Him. Our call is to enter into a place of intercession and stand there until the body of Christ is built up in that area. That's the challenge that we all have here. That's the challenge that I have as your pastor to rise above the fleshly responses that you may want to have sometimes. Is it easy being a preacher here? No. It's not easy anywhere. Is it challenging? Yes. Is it stressful, Mark? Yes. Do we do more than what many of you think? Yes. But you know what? Ultimately, we give an account to you But ultimately, I'll stand before God to give an account for what I've done with this responsibility that I have here. It is an awesome job. The benefits, as they say, are out of this world. But it's a hard job because we're dealing. Folks, do you realize that every day we're dealing with people that are fixing to bust the gates of hell wide open? Lives that are destroyed, or they think they are. And along comes Mark and I. I'm just talking about your pastors. This is all of us. All of us have our spiritual um, divine appointments that we're to go to. It's just like uh, my brother here today came to the office and it was a divine appointment to sit there and to speak life into him. And as I did it, it built me up and helped me to realize that i got to get my eyes on Christ. So folks, we've got to... We've, we've got to pull together. We need one another. That's why it's important for a David Mabe to be here. To be able to worship here in the house of God. That's why it's important for Mark to be here. That's why Gary and Pam. For all of us that are in here today, it's important to be joined together because we can't go it alone. We need one another to strengthen each other. Now, our call is to enter in this place in intercession and stand there until there's healing in the body. So I I go to the next question. And again, all this kind of dovetails into the same. Is the devil at the throne of God? Now I want you to think about this now. Is he at the throne of God? Well, Ephesians, and I'm going to go quickly now. But you can write these down if you want to. But Ephesians 2, 6 tells us that we've been raised up and seated in heavenly places. Well, you know where their heavenly places is talking about? Spiritual realm. And I can get ahead of myself a little bit and tell you, that's where Satan is allowed to be, in the spiritual realm. Now, while we are clearly here on this earth, our spirits have been brought in direct fellowship with God in heaven. Once you got saved, do y'all realize this? That once you got saved, your eternal clock has already started ticking. Now, for those that don't believe that you can be saved and, and, and be forever saved, born again, then you live in defeat and, and discouragement because that's hard life to be good enough 
How many of you in here is good enough to be saved? None of us. None of us can be good enough to earn salvation. But by faith we must trust that God is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. Folks, it is the only hope that I have in my life that despite my weaknesses, despite my failures, that my God, through the power of Jesus and His blood that was shed willingly on that cross, is able to hold my soul despite my failures, my shortcomings. Now, I'll say this. To be truly a child of God, there's got to be a change. There's got to be something in your life that shows that you've been transformed, that you've been changed. There's got to be a desire to honor Him and serve Him. There's a lot of people that claim, I'm saved, and they don't know Him. There's going to be a lot of people in that day that's going to stand before God and say, say, Lord, I did all these things. We talked about this this morning service. I did all these things. I've served and worked in the church. I've given to the poor and the needy. I've tried to not cheat people. I've tried to do the right thing. And God's going to say, and I had a guy tell me the other day. He said, uh, I go to church every once in a while. He said, I give my tithe money to the church. He said, I try to do good things. And he said, I always thought that I was right. But folks, you've got to be born again. You've got to call upon the master. And he's got to change you from inside. Do I believe in once saved, I always say, if you've truly been born again, then yes, I do. But there's a lot of people that think they have a head knowledge of Christ is enough, and they don't know Him. The Bible says that He's going to look at some people and say, depart from me, for I never knew you. I had that scripture this morning about where Moses was talking about that he knew his name. I want Jesus to know my name. I want him to know me. I want him to have my name on that book of life. And I pray that all of yours is there too. Now, while we are clearly here on this earth, our spirits have been brought into his presence and fellowship with God. So our eternal clock has already started. We're not what we're going to be yet, but we're headed there. You've been delivered. Now, we can boldly approach the throne of God's grace at any time. And I don't care what anybody tells you, you have the ability as a born-again believer to go before the throne of grace at any time. And you don't have to go through a preacher, a priest, or anything else. And that we can enter into His presence through prayer. Now, worship in the holy place of God. Well, I want you, if you would, and we'll just go to a couple of these. we we'll go to the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 4, and let's look at verse 6. And we'll look at uh, verse 16, I'm sorry. Chapter 4, verse 16. It says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. And folks, that's a challenge for all of us today. Now, if you would, go over to chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews. We want to look at verse 19 and 20 of chapter 10. It says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Folks, do y'all remember when Jesus died on the cross? It says, you remember what happened to the veil of the temple that separated the holy of holies from where a man or a woman could not have access in there? God took and took that veil and ripped it from the top to the bottom and says you now have direct access to the Father. Thank God today that we have that. And that's what that's saying, that you have access today to run to God and to be able to cry out to Him. And so we must enter into that and just trust Him. Now, we're going to examine a doctrine that has been a source of confusion for many of saints. And many people don't understand. All right, question. Is Satan in heaven also? You think about that. Well, some of you will probably say, well, I remember back in Job, it said that when the angels were walking around to give an account that Job showed up and, I mean, or Satan showed up and uh, talked to God and 
He asked him what he was doing. He said, walking to and fro upon the earth. I already remember that. Trying to see who he could get. Is he actually standing before the throne of holy God? Now, we're taught clearly that there's no sin that will ever enter into God's presence because he is holy. But again, we talk about him being in heavenly places, which is in the spiritual realm. Now, you've got to stay with me on this. And just listen with me for a little bit. In Revelation chapter 4, we find no evidence of the devil found there. In Hebrews chapter 12, no devil in heaven during the discourse of the heavenly Jerusalem. You can't find him there. So where is the devil? If you would, go to Jude 6. And let's look at Jude 6. And I'm going to do the best I can. I know this is kind of deep. But uh, it's good for us to know this stuff and to try to learn it. And just pray that the Holy Spirit would allow us to know. In Jude 6, it says this, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. These are the demons now that went with Satan when they revolted. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. So we know that many of those angels that revolted and left heaven were kicked out of heaven and they left. The bottom line is, to this day they're chained in darkness. They're in wickedness. Now go over to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And let's look at... Uh, I believe it's 5b. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So therefore, what is Satan? The father of lies. He is deceitful. He is wicked. He is the epitome of, holy, uh, of wickedness. He's anti-everything God is. So therefore, Satan will not have any direct access into the kingdom of heaven or before the throne of God. Now, you imagine that. Now, how do we explain the scriptures which allude to the devil being in heaven? Well, I want you to understand, and, it, and I'll do the best I can, but there are three realms known as heaven in the Bible. Now, the first realm is the eternal abode of the blessed, that heavenly dwelling of the Trinity, the angels, and the redeemed of the Lord. That is the place that we're all going someday. And I could give you a whole list of scriptures. You could look at Mark 16, 19, or John 14, 2 and 3. I go to prepare a place for you. 2 Peter 3, 13, and Isaiah 66, 1. But for the sake of time. So there's the eternal abode that we will go to that we refer to as heaven. They'll have the beautiful walls of the gates and, and uh, crystal river and the tree of life, all that. But there's a second place. Heaven is used to describe the sky. We say, look into the heavens at the beautiful stars and about the spiritual warfare and stuff and all, or the spiritual stuff. As we look into heaven, we see the sun, the moon, the stars, the glory of the beautiful day that we see even right now out there is to describe the sky. In Psalm 19, 1, it says the heavens will declare the glory, the glory of God. So we know that that refers to that. Now, the third heaven that we want to talk about right now, just briefly, is the Bible speaks of Satan being in heavenly places. A heaven, uh, again referred to, that is, that is referring to a relatively unknown dimension of life, and it's called the spirit realm. If you remember, if you go back into the book of Daniel, and Daniel was crying out to God and praying and asking for divine help. And remember the angel said, I've been trying to get to you for over a month, but I've been doing spiritual warfare in heavenly places. On, on your behalf, I've been fighting, trying to get to you to be able to let you know that God has heard your prayer. Folks, there's a realm that is around us, and it's a spiritual realm. As a matter of fact, just go to uh, Ephesians, if you would, chapter 6. 
Ephesians chapter 6. And we have read this many times, but um, I want you to be reminded of it today. Look at verse 10. And we'll read on just a little bit. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. All right, everybody understands that. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The spiritual realm. And then it goes on and says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. And it goes on a list of things that you've got to carry with you in your life to be able to overcome the enemy. So the spirit realm. This heaven is the spiritual territory which from Satan seeks to control this world. So you say, well, well, is Satan the one that accuses the brethren? It is Satan that is using us to accuse the brethren. It is Satan that will use your lips and the condition of your heart to do his bidding as he attacks us from that spiritual realm coming at us. Yes, God knows what's going on. He knows where Satan's at. He knows where he's at, what he's doing. And there's no doubt that there's been communication between them. But he is not in the presence of holy God. He's in the spiritual realm. And we have to understand, folks, I heard this said a long time ago, and I'm certainly no expert in this area. But it would terrify us if we could really have the spiritual scales removed from our eyes and to see the ongoing warfare and battles that are taking place in the spiritual realm dealing with your life and my life and our family's life. It ought to get our attention today as we look at this. Now, If the devil is not in the highest heaven, if he's not where we're going to be living, how does he accuse the saints before the throne of God? Well, first, Christ has positioned our spirits in him before God's throne. Our spirits connect us to God. Everybody agreed with me that we're connected with him. Our bodies and souls are still right now, for those of us that are alive, we're still on this earth. So we're still here. We have been born again. Our spirits now are in tune with Him, but our bodies are still in this world, and we're still here. The devil does not have direct access to God. He does have access to our thoughts and our words. Let me just ask you this. Any of you had your minds attacked lately? Been thumbing through a cell phone or your computer and see something filthy that you shouldn't even read? Or see a picture that you shouldn't hear? Guess where that comes from? That is a tax from the spiritual realm devised to take you away from God. And to bring defeat and all kind of division amongst the body of believers. Satan does have access to your minds, your thoughts, and your lips. That's why we can have people, i got to be careful or I'll say too much, Mark. That's why sometimes people can do things. And it's not right. The thinking behind it, they may be correct in a certain way. But God says, you're not given the authority or the freedom to do like that. you got to love people. Instead of trying to stomp them. Instead of trying to... Just mash them down. And folks, we have to understand where that comes from. And it comes from the enemy. It comes from spiritual attacks. And folks, I'm talking about the house of God. We want people to be saved here. We want people to get born again in this place. Some of you ask, well, why is so many people getting saved down there at the office? And there's been people been saved here. But why has so many people got saved down there at the office talking to him, talking to me, and, and we work through it and God has a d- divine appointment? I would, I, would, I would say somewhere between 15 and 20 people have been born again in the church office. 
The other day we had a man that got saved, came to the altar of God and got saved. So God is still working. But why have we not had more? Could it be that as Satan attacks our body of believers, that it inhibits the working of the Holy Ghost in here? I'm not trying to say that we're perfect but what I'm saying is we've got to be very careful that we probably have people living in here that are not where they're supposed to be with Christ. And it restricts the flow of the Holy Ghost as it gets a hold of hearts. I'm just trying to tell you, be honest and truthful with you tonight. And that's where we're at. And for our church to be dynamic... For our church to be a place where people are born again, where lives are changed for an eternity, we've got to be able to understand that we have an enemy that wants to stop us and that we have to put the enemy down by the power of the blood and by calling on his name in Jesus' name. This morning we were praying down there in that office and when you invoke the name of Jesus and you invoke the blood of the Lamb and you invoke the power that came because of that cross... Things begin to happen. And folks, that's what it's got to be up here. There's wonderful people in this church. Wonderful people. But folks, we can't allow Satan to enter in in any way that would prohibit the Spirit of God being able to work. I'm proud to say that many times I've walked up to this pulpit and felt like somebody just dumped a whole uh, tub of stuff that's just like electricity on me. I can feel the presence of God as it runs down my head sometimes, literally. Sometimes I can be sitting there and feel electricity run up my arms. I felt it this morning. Up the back of my neck. That is the presence of holy God as it works with an imperfect individual like me. God, if He can still use me, He can use you. And he still chooses to use us despite ourselves. Folks, imagine what this church could do if all of us, starting with your pastor and your associate pastor, if we sold out for God, if we truly allowed him to sanctify us, to set us free from the things of this world, and allowed us to get our mind fully on him, and that we hungered and thirsted for his righteousness, and we hungered and thirsted for that lost man or that lost boy, they would be men and women, boys and girls, flocking down these aisles to be born again and to be saved and delivered. And it can be that way. That's why God sent me here. That's why God sent him here. And that's why God sent all of you here. It's for us to understand that that's what we got to do. For God to turn this place around and for God to use it for His glory. It's a wonderful church. I'm proud to be associated with Balfour Baptist Church, but we are not what God would truly have us to fully be until we sell out to Him and to allow Him to take our lives. Now, if we harbor sympathetic attitudes toward fault-finding, blaming, and we try to justify criticism or gossip. We're allowing Satan to use our mouth to accuse the saints before God. Think about it. It's a little bit different way of thinking about this, but this is what we need to get a hold of. Hebrews 4.13 says, All things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God already knows what's going on. He realizes what's happening. In Luke 12, 3, it talks about uh, what you have said in darkness shall be, be brought to light. God is the ear at every conversation. He knows the path that you take. He knows what you deal with. He knows what's going on in your life. I can sit here and try to cover my life and try to present one image to Doug, but my God knows me. I told him this morning, God, you know where I'm weak. You know what I struggle with. You know where I'm strong. You know what you've blessed me with. And you know what you've envisioned for me to be able to accomplish for the kingdom of heaven. And with all that, I have to be willing to submit to him and allow him to help give me victory over the attacks of the enemy. You think the devil doesn't attack a preacher? If he could destroy me and destroy this church, 
If he can destroy him, then he's got all of you. Heard anyway. So folks, that's where we're at today. God does hear the voice of the accuser. Even the guarded confidence of a spouse. God hears it all. So you got to learn to guard your tongue. Much of what the Father supplies to the body comes through our confession. It consists of everything that comes out of our mouths. Matthew 12, 36 says that men shall be judged for every idle word or careless word, we might say, that they speak. That means everything that comes out of their mouth. If I'm sitting there at breakfast and I'm talking about me now. If I'm sitting there at breakfast with a bunch of Christian friends. And if I allow my mouth to say something that I shouldn't say, God will hold me accountable for what damage is done for my testimony with others. And sometimes when the Holy Spirit takes a finger and it puts it on my heart, and he says, buddy, that ought not been said. Then I have to go before the Lord. My Bible tells me that if I confess my sins, that my God will forgive me of all my sins and wash them away. And you get up and you're clean. So that's where we got to be, folks. we got to be careful with what we're doing. And, it, and, and again, realizing that the tongue is one of the avenues that Satan tries to use. Our mouth is an overflow of the condition of our heart. I truly believe this. If you hear a man that claims to be born again, and you hear filth coming out of his mouth, then it ought to tell you there's filth in his heart. That's truth. Ladies, if you hear somebody that can't do nothing but tear somebody apart and talk ugly and down and have hatred and stuff, that means that that same stuff is inside the heart. So we've got to be careful with that. When our tongues are unbridled, like James 3, 6 says, it tells us that our negative confession sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. If we love one another... If we're supportive of one another, if we're protected of one another, we experience much growth and greater protection. So as your pastor today, we've got to love one another. We've got to support one another. And we've got to protect one another in prayer. However, if we find fault, if we criticize all the time, if we falsely accuse or lie about somebody, the voice of the accuser of the brethren is manifested and we are judged for our idle and evil words. As Satan uses our mouth and our heart and our mind for his glory. God looks at what we have said and gives to us accordingly. God help us, as I just heard. God have mercy on us. We must realize and understand that each of our Thoughts and our intimate conversations are nothing but prayers that are being offered to the Father who sees all things, hears all things, even those things that we think are in secret. God already knows them. Our words about one another as well as our words to one another should carry within the same sense of reverence as when we speak to God himself for he is listening. Now I want you to think about that. Think about that. Now, we're, we're moving pretty close to being through tonight. I know it's a lot of stuff. And I know this is not an easy message tonight. But it hits all of us as born-again believers. It is significant when Isaiah saw the Lord in Isaiah 6. And he said he saw him holy and high and lifted up. And yet, you hear what he said. He said, woe is me, for I am a man undone. In other words, I'm ruined because I'm a man with unclean lips. And I live amongst a people with unclean lips. Folks, our God is holy. Do y'all really know what it means to be holy? Do I really understand and comprehend? We could say it, but do we really understand our God is holy? He has commanded us to be you holy as I am holy. The fact is this, our criticism of one another is the voice of Satan 
accusing the saints before God. Think about this. Isaiah's lips were cleansed after being touched by a burning coal taken from the altar of God. The closer we draw to God, the more guilt we shall feel over our unclean words. Our tongues must be purified by the fire of God from the altar. And a tongue that is cleansed of fault finding and criticism is one that is cleansed by the power of God. Now the last thing that we're going to deal with tonight is the casting down of the accuser. Remember it said that, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even unto death. And let's break that down very quickly. The blood of the Lamb, the merits of Christ's death on Calvary, the merits that he willingly allowed them to nail him to that tree, and he was beaten beyond recognition, and he did it to take your place and pay your sin debt and my sin debt. And I didn't deserve it, but he did it because he loved me. One blow f- froze through all of us. Here, here's the deal. Leonard Covington is what we call a black man. Some would say a brown man, but he's a black man. But you know what? The power of the blood runs through his life as much as it does run through my life, as it does her life or your life or your life. And it makes us one in Christ, the family of the living God. The power of the blood that when he sees us, that Jesus loves us. And he loves us with all of his heart. And he created all of us and he did not make any junk. That we're all special in his sight. And he shed his blood so much for us. The blood pays for our sin debt, provides our redemption. And when the attacks of the accuser come, it disarms him and keeps those accusations away from us. The shedding of the blood declares our common need of Jesus. The word of their testimony. It means telling others what God has done for us. It means giving a testimony. It means being willing to stand up here and tell somebody what Jesus did for you. It means being baptized back there and saying, I'm dead to the old way of life, risen to a new life because Christ has saved me. It's to overcome the enemy, we must think prophetically. We must see the end from how we began. 1 Timothy 1.18 says, Knowing and speaking the living word of God and allows us to overcome the illusions of the enemy. Now, the third point is loving not our lives even unto death. We can't overcome the vice hold Satan may have placed on us if we simultaneously harbor self-pity, sympathy for the vice that needs to be crucified with us. In other words, you make excuses. Well, the reason I do this is I don't get what I'm supposed to be getting here or there or this is not fulfilling me or whatever, and we turn to filth of the world. And God is saying that that's where we got problems. Our victory is consummated by our willingness to go even to death rather than betray our convictions of truth. Now Acts 20, 24 says this, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course. So folks, I asked you today, are you willing, am I willing to die to self? And to finish the course, running strong. Will we be found faithful? Will we do the right thing? The accuser must first be cast down in our minds. In other words, we've got to put the enemy down in our minds. We've got to, we've got to uh, attack this with the power of the blood. The power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot tolerate fact-finding accusations. We must possess the heart of God toward our brethren. That's the only way you can love all these people is to have the love of God inside of you that does it for you. The authority of Christ will be seen when we become motivated by love in our prayer life. That we pray for others and that we seek His face. And when we see a need, we cast down the accuser of the brethren when we pray. And we seek the face of God. 
Now, I could go on here, but I have to draw this to a conclusion. And I am going to give you this much, but we won't go to it and read it. I'll give you the, the scripture that you can go back and look at. But you might say, well, Pastor, what is the defense against Satan? First of all, the present intercessory work of Christ, which is found in John 15, 17. We've got to trust in what Christ did on the cross and the power of the blood. Secondly, the purpose of God may include using Satan for beneficial purposes in the life of a Christian. Mistakes, problems, and troubles, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 tells us that. Thirdly, the Christian should never speak contemptuously of Satan. I have some people say, you know, they'll make light of the devil and they'll try to say something funny that, you know, it's just a big game. The Bible says that we're to never speak contemptuously of the enemy. He is a powerful being and our Father can overcome him. And through the power of the blood and the Holy Spirit, the believer should always be on guard. 1 Peter 5.8 says that, that Satan is like a roaring lion walking about whom he may devour. And he's looking to devour you. He's looking to devour me. And folks, we've got to be on guard constantly. Fifthly, the believer should take a stand against Satan. James 4.7 talks about this. You must be willing, as Mark says sometime to me, you got to dig your hooves in and say, I am a child of God. I will not be defeated by the enemy. And God, in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of your blood invested in my life, I stand today regardless of what comes. I stand for what I know is the truth in my life. And I stand in protection over my wife, my children, my mother, my grandbabies, whoever it may be, I stand on your name and your truth today. Amen? That's what you got to do. And then the sixth thing is the believer should use his or her armor each and every day. Ephesians chapter 6, 11 through 18. Helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. The Word of God in your hand. Amen. The shield of faith as the enemy attacks each one of us. So folks, I challenge you tonight. I know that this has been a different, but to me it's extremely deep because this is where the rubber meets the road. Amen. If you're born again tonight, the devil does attack you. And he will attack you. Lost people, he's got them. They're deceived. They're on a highway to hell. But God. There's still people out there that's going to get saved. There's still lives to change. And there's no lost causes with Christ. And folks, the devil has trained his eye on churches like Balfour. That if I can get them divided and get their eyes off of coming to the house of God. Receiving the strength they need from the word of God. Thank God we had the ability that Brother Dwight and Harold and Brendan and all them that worked so hard at this that, that we had the ability to get the Word of God out. But folks, there is nothing like coming to the house of the living God and to worship Him. So folks, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Keep your eyes upon Him. Trust Him. And as we move forward, allow Him to guide us where we need to go. I told you all the story again the other day, and I'll just remind you of it, of, of a black prisoner. And it was powerful that day that I saw him at Randolph Correctional Institute. He'd been incarcerated, I believe, over 40 years of his life in prison. Got saved, got born again. And when that man stood up, he's actually out of prison right now. But that day when he stood up, and he said, Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. And I remember that day the Holy Ghost got a hold of my heart. And I was sitting there saying the same words. God, I can't walk either without you holding my hand. Lord, I can't make it without you. And I don't know how to do it without you. So, folks, may you turn to him today. May you trust him. And may God help us today to be faithful to him. If you would, bow with me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for 
Lord, this privilege that we've had to have the Word tonight. I know that it's been fairly full of details. And Lord, I pray that I've done the best that I can with the, the limited amount of knowledge that I have. Lord, I trust tonight that, Lord, my Bible tells me that if you be lifted up, that you'll draw all men unto you. And Lord, that the Holy Spirit blesses the Word of God. So, Lord, I pray tonight that, God, you'll do what I can do. Lord, help us to realize, God, that uh, we're in a spiritual battle. And that, Lord, that our time is coming when the trumpet of God shall sound. Or, Lord, when our life is summoned home. God, help us to be ready. Lord, I talked to a dear friend just today who said that he was at a funeral recently and there was people there that, Lord, left this world. And they weren't ready to go. God, help me to be committed to do my best to see that men and women, boys and girls, are born again and that they avoid this awful place called hell. God, help us tonight to trust you. Help us as believers tonight, Lord, to depend upon you. Lord, we can't make it without you guiding us. We can't make it without you holding our hand. And Father, yet I'm reminded, like the old song says, the anchor holds. So God, be our anchor to hold in this time of storm in this world. God, help us to keep our eyes upon you. And Lord, bless us and lead us, Father, we pray. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed being with us today here at Balfour. Uh, I hope you've received the Word of God. It's our full intent to minister to you in Jesus' name. And I realize that these days that we're living in right now are trying for all of us and people are being stretched. But there is hope in the Word of God. And so our promise to you is that we will continue to, to share the Word and uh, pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to us and help us. And so I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. And if you have any prayer concerns or if you uh, need anything further that I can do or Pastor Mark can do, please feel free to call us here at Balfour, 336-672-0074, uh, and we'll try to return your call and set up a time that we can sit down with you and talk with you. But again, thank you for being with us here at our church. May God bless you in a rich and wonderful way.